Fine in, everyone. We've got about five minutes. Anybody have any questions? Feel free to ask. <clears throat> Hmm. Still got a whole four people. Check, make sure my sharing screen works. Feel free to ask any questions, guys. I just want to make sure I can get my iPad to show up on the screen. So I'm doing that now. Stop sharing. Admit all. Still got about two minutes. Coming in.
All right. Well, it's time to start. Looks like no one has any questions, so I should go ahead and get started. Uh, I guess actually today you guys took your no, your two forty one class. So you're taking your test on Monday. Uh, I don't know. Let me double check this real quick. Yes, that's right. So uh, I'm going to make another practice test. I just had enough time to do it for one of my classes. So I'm going to do the same thing for this class as well. I'll do it right after uh, right after tonight's class. So there'll be a test three. It'll say PT underscore zero three, blah, blah, blah. But it's just going to be on chapters one, two, and uh, let me see. Yeah, one, two, and three, because that's all the test is going to be on. And uh, that'll be more geared to urge exactly what you need to be prepared for on Monday during your lab. So uh, uh, that's why that uh, actual test is up there. I put it in today. I copied it from another class, but I put it in and I initially put it in for today, like for some reason, because I was thinking that your class met today, but you clearly didn't. So anyways, that's taken care of. Uh, and that'll be during lab. Basically, I'll give you as much time as uh, your lab instructor will give you, and that could be, you know, a couple, it might be one hour, might be two hours, might be the whole lab, I'm not sure, but I'll leave that up to her. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. Like I said, I just want to let you know that I will be putting a practice test up there. So uh, good luck on that, and I hope you all do well. I've had good results in my 241 class that took it earlier. Uh, the actual average was quite a bit higher than I'm used to on the first face-to-face -face test. Normally, the test average on the first face-to-face -face is somewhere between the mid to upper 40s to lower 50s, which is horrible, I know. Uh, but that's also a, a time for students to realize, oh, what I've been doing is not necessarily learning. It's more like I've been looking up really good ways to solve problems. So we normally expect it to be, uh, you know, pretty low first score. And then they learn by the second one. Oh, okay. So I, I can't lean that much on Chegg. I can't lean that much on all this other stuff. So anyways, the, uh, <clears throat> the test today or the test that I did do for my 241 students, uh, they ended up getting a 67 class average, which is really pretty good. So, uh, and in fact, the highest, I think was a 97, 98, something like that. And I had three or four A's. So that's, that's a normal test. That's a normal physics test. So uh, hopefully you guys will be just as good, if not even better. And uh, feel free to ask me questions. Of course, you need to know your vector stuff. You need to know about components, all that good stuff. But uh, anyways, doing the practice test should help you a lot. I'm going to start off with where we left off last time. So last time I had done exactly one conservation or excuse me one newton second law problem and i need you i need to hash out some of the details of how to uh, uh how to solve such problems so one of the key ingredients of course is knowing newton's second law and as i said before you need to know not only newton's second law you need to know newton's first law newton's second law newton's third law mm -hmm. and newton's law of universal gravitation and you need to know which ones are which so it's not enough to just know that one of them is sec is the second law and one of them is the third law. You actually need to know specifically which one's which. Uh, but right now we're we're going to start with that. And basically our version of Newton's second law right now is what I use is that sigma, you know, that capital Greek letter that looks like an E kind of weird, uh, sigma F, which means the sum of all the forces. And notice that sum, not subtraction. The sum of all the forces vector symbol is equal to mass times acceleration, again, with a vector symbol. So the A is acceleration and the uh, F is an acceleration. And that is generally what it works out to be when the total force and the mass is not a function of time. Uh, that's what we're going to study first in Newton's laws of motion. And then eventually we'll get to the point where we're going to have to take into account forces that are functions of time, in which case F equals MA or sigma F vector equals M times A vector. That's going to become a differential equation in which A is dV dt, where V is the velocity vector, or A is d2R over dt squared, where R is the position vector. So for right now, uh, we're going to focus more on that. And what I need you to know, obviously, is Newton's second law. I need you to know how to do free body diagrams. And I need you to know how to do free body diagrams so that you don't miss any forces. So I'm going to try to uh, iterate all that uh, in what I'm getting ready to show you. So let's start by sharing my screen. So I've got 
it's selected to share screen and now I'm clicking on the appropriate thing on my iPad and up should pop Newton's second law in the version of A being a constant. Okay. So in the version of A being a constant, that is the sigma F vector is equal to mass times acceleration, as you see written in the top left-hand side. Now, uh, that is a vector equation, and that's an equation all by itself. It's actually a valuable equation. Uh, the deal is, though, that uh, a lot of times you can't solve a physics problem working with a vector equation. You actually have to uh, create a coordinate system and then create the vectors within the coordinate system and then use the coordinate versions of Newton's second law. So that's what I've written off to the right. Uh, in general, space is three-dimensional. And in general, we could use Cartesian coordinates, in which case uh, the summation of the force vector uh, is equal to mass times acceleration vector becomes three independent equations, sort of independent, or three equations uh, for each of the x, y, and z axes. So the summation of forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. Summation of forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. And the summation of the forces in the z direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the z direction. So uh, in those cases, you're actually talking about components. So the actual magnitudes of components are always, I mean, all the magnitudes are just positive, period. So the magnitude of a vector is positive. The magnitude of a uh, vector component is also positive. But we indicate the direction when you're down to coordinates and coordinate axes we indicate the direction of a component by adding a positive or negative sign. So a lot of times you'll see me write F minus W or F minus G cosine theta times M or something like that. I'm not ever subtracting, okay? I'm mathematically doing the equivalent of subtracting, but the deal is Newton's second law says add up all the forces, period. You're adding them. Now, if the components actually are negative, then that becomes adding a negative number, which can be interpreted as subtracting a positive number. So that's why you'll occasionally see it look like a minus. But I need you to know that the left-hand side is always an addition of, uh, well, it's either one force all by itself on the left-hand side, or it's an addition of more than one forces uh, on the left-hand side. And the components could, act, in fact, be positive or negative. So it looks like it's subtraction. The uh, right-hand side, of course, is the acceleration in the x direction times the mass, or the acceleration in the y direction times the mass, or the acceleration in the z direction times the mass, and so on and so forth. Now, as a first example, I want to stress something here. Uh, there's a big idea where uh, you have to basically decide when you go to solve a problem, what exactly is the system that you're analyzing with Newton's second law? So for instance, right here, I have a train of boxes and the boxes are sitting on, let's say an ice skating ring. So they don't have any friction because I haven't covered friction for you yet. And the leftmost box has a mass of 10 kilograms. The second box has a mass of four kilograms. And the third box have a mass of 12.15 kilograms. And to the right, there is a force of 75.0 Newtons pulling on the rightmost box. And there's a string connecting the first box to the second box and the second box to the third box. And uh, the string has tensions in it, T2 and T1, are the different strings have different tensions in them, uh, T2 and T1. And your job here would be to solve and find out the actual acceleration of the train and to find out the individual tensions uh, that are part of the train. Now, the, the part of this that I want you to understand is when you choose to use F equals MA, uh, obviously you're probably going to break it down to vectors in a coordinate system. And you're going to have, of course, equations that relate for the X direction and equations that relate for the Y direction and so on and so forth. But you're also going to have to decide exactly what is the system. So I can treat this whole big train as a system. Or I can treat mass three as a system, mass two is another system, and mass one is another system. All of that's reasonable, but from you know my old age and my white beard, I've learned that there's certain uh, ways that problems can be solved that makes life a lot easier. And in this particular case, it turns out that it's really easy to initially 
pretend the system is the whole train. Okay. Now the downside of treating the whole system as the, the train uh, is there's a lot of ways to make errors in that. So that's usually not the best way to do it, but sometimes it is. And another thing to realize is if you treat the whole train as a system, Newton's law, Newton's second law, F equals MA, only applies to external forces acting on the system. So with that system being the whole train, T1 is an internal force. T2 is an internal force. Therefore, you can never, ever, ever figure out T1 and T2 as long as you're using the train as the system. That being said, there is a uh, no rule that requires you to use the same system throughout the whole problem. And what's really the best is what I'm getting ready to do now. And I'll say it's the best, meaning it's just the easiest. And I'll explain a little bit more about what that means in a second. So let's start off with our solution. So what we're asked to do is to find the acceleration of mainly this train. And what I want you to understand is we're going to make certain assumptions. The assumptions we're making right now is that there's no friction force. And that's mainly because I haven't taught you about friction forces yet. Uh, that's something we can remedy pretty quickly, but we're not going to yet. Uh, another thing that we're going to do is we are going to treat the whole system, the whole train as uh, the mass that we're considering. So I'm going to say that the summation of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. And uh, I'm going to assume that the ropes that connect box two to box three and box uh, one to box two, they're never going to become slack and they're not going to stretch. So if the rightmost box, by pulling with that 75 Newton force, if the rightmost box, M3, moves one inch, then guess what? M2 is going to move one inch and M3, uh, M1 is going to move one inch again to the right. If I went to the left, that'd be a little problematic because ropes and cables and things that have tension in them don't normally have much of a force in compression. They only have forces and tensions. So we're not going to examine any situation where the where the rope is going to stretch, become slack, or actually be put in compression. Okay. So since the rightmost box moves one inch, that would cause the second box to move one inch. And that would cause the third box, M1, to move one inch to the right as well. If that uh, right box moved one inch in one second, well, M2 would move one inch in one second, and M1 would uh, move one inch in one second. That suggests that their velocities are going to be the same. If I went further and said, I'm going to move initially uh, M3 to the right at a rate of one uh, inch per second, and then after a whole second, I'm going to increase it to two inches per second. Then the exact same thing is going to happen to M2. It's going to go from one inch per second to two inches per second in a single second. And the exact same thing is going to happen to M1. And it's going to go from one inch per second to two inches per second in one second. So that shows that the accelerations of all these three things are the same. So I'm not going to waste any time by subscripting the A. I'm just going to, well, I will initially, but then I'm just going to call it A and solve for it. So initially, our system is going to be it's the whole train. And the train is what I called it. So I'll put quotation marks around because it's obviously not really a train. And what we have is the summation of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration which in this case, uh, we're not really imagining the boxes as if they're jumping off the table or digging into the table. So really the Y direction is not gonna be that relevant. I'm gonna, I'm gonna set it up uh, on purpose, but it's not gonna be that big of a deal. So I'm gonna reduce this to the summation of the forces in the X direction equals mass times acceleration in the X direction and the summation forces in the Y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction, like that, okay? So first off, with the system being the whole train, I'm going to uh, draw a free body diagram. So that's another step on this. You always want to draw a free body diagram of your system. And my system is going to be basically a coordinate system like this. 
okay? And it's going to have an x-axis, and it's going to have a y-axis. Uh, I could have drawn just a single axis if I wanted to, but I, I want to go ahead and show you what happens with the y-axis as well. And in fact, I'm going to represent this as just a single dot. That's sort of what we do a lot of times when we're initially studying physics is we treat objects as if they're point particles. Uh, once we learn about torque and stuff like that, then we'll actually treat them as extended bodies that, you know, where you're actually applying the force matters. But right now, I'm going to treat the whole body as, notice I've got 10 kilograms plus 4 kilograms, so that's 14, plus 12, that's uh, 26.15. So this will be 26.15 kilograms and notice all of them were specified to two decimal places so the two decimal places are all significant figures so that that matters now the forces acting on it are going to be uh let's see here i'm going to use green as my positive direction and red as my negative direction so there's obviously going to be a normal force acting upward and since I've drawn up as a positive y direction, I drew the normal force as green. And there's going to be a weight pointing downwards. And uh, after this, I'll show you why the weight is what it is. I meant to do it beforehand, but I didn't. But this weight is going to be m times g. And that is uh, 26.15 times 9.8 gives me 256.27. And that is kilograms times meters per second squared, which in fact uh, turns out to be Newtons. That I'll cover that as well. Uh, I did multiply 26.15, which had four sig figs, times 9.80, which only has three sig figs. So technically the two and the seven are not sig figs. So I should put it right like that. Now, that's the two forces in the vertical direction. And then there's one more force in the horizontal direction. And that one's in the positive direction. And that's F is equal to 75.0 Newtons. Okay. So here's the big test when you're making your free body diagram. You want to make sure you include all the forces. And the way you do that is you say, uh, what things are touching my system? So in this case, when I look at the system, I say the floor is touching the system. In other words, that platform or whatever that the boxes are on is touching the system. So there should be a force from that. I also have uh, either a hand or a rope that with a, with a hand attached to it, uh, pulling to the right with a force of 75 Newtons. So that's another force that has to be accounted for. That's all the things that are touching it. Uh, except for like air, so and I'm ignoring air resistance, so I don't have to do that. Uh, but that's all the forces that are due to things directly touching it. Once you've done all the things that are directly touching it, then you only have to consider a couple more things, and you've got to consider those. There are certain forces in nature that do what we call action at a distance. Gravity is one of them. So you, after you do all the things touching it, then you got to say, is there a gravitational force? Because the earth can pull on you even though you're not touching the earth. Uh, there's other forces like the electric force, the magnetic force, or the, the two nuclear forces. They could be touching, uh, they could be applying a force too uh, without touching you. We haven't learned anything about the electric or magnetic or the nuclear forces. So you can eliminate those for right now, but we do have gravity. And that's why I have the 256.27. So using that test of first, what's touching the system? And then two, is gravity acting? Uh, I'm now 100% certain that I've addressed all the forces, okay? So now all I have to do is take my summation of forces in the y direction, which is not the most important one, by the way. Uh, it's the one that I'm just doing because I have to. So. This is the summation forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. As I told you, I'm not expecting these boxes to jump up. I'm not expecting them to dig into the surface. So in fact, they're always going to be sitting still relative to the y axis. 
And since they're sitting still and they're still sitting still and they're still sitting still, that means the acceleration is zero. And all I get is, and here's one time where I'm actually going to write it the plus way instead of showing a minus. I'm going to do Fn, which points in the vertical direction. So that's a positive. And then I'm going to say plus negative 256. 0.27 newtons is equal to zero okay that's really what's going on on the left hand side it's always adding so i took the time to show you again that it is addition uh but i could have just as easily wrote an fn minus 256.27 and that would be correct too it's just i want you to make make sure you understand that you're never subtracting forces you're always adding them so I can solve this and find out, in fact, that the normal force, the force that the floor has to be able to supply to keep the thing from digging into it, is in fact 256.27 newtons. Now, if I was turning this in, I'd say it's 256 newtons because that's the proper number of sig figs. Okay. So I've done the y direction. I didn't need it. In fact, we don't really need the y direction still until we start talking about accelerations in the y direction or until we start studying friction, which is where uh, it turns out that the normal force is relevant to calculating the friction. So now I'm going to go back with the summation of the forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. Now, this one uh, should actually cause some acceleration. And as I told you, whatever acceleration M3 has, all of them are going to have the same acceleration. So I'm just going to call it A. And in fact, the only force acting to the right here is the 75 newtons. And that's a positive. So I'm going to say 75.0 newtons is equal to 26.15 kilograms times A. Okay. So now all I have to do is uh, recognize what mathematical operation is going on between the 26.15 kilograms and the A. Is this adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, differentiating, integrating? Anybody? Multiplication. Multiplication. I mean, I'm sorry. 26.15 is multiplying by the A. And what's the opposite of, of multiplication? Division. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, division. And of course, if I divide by 26.15, whatever I do to one side, I've got to do to the other. So that's what's happening to this. Now, the Newton is technically a kilogram times a meter divided by second squared. So when you divide it by a kilogram, you just get meters per second squared. So I'm going to do 75 divided by 26.15. And that, of course, is three sig figs divided by four sig figs. So that should give me three sig figs. So I'm going to say it's 2.868. And that is meters. And since we're talking about acceleration, it's good to break it up and call it meters per second every second. And that's equal to A, but that's with one extra sig fig. So I'm marking it that way. So that's the acceleration of the whole system. Now, that was good. That was uh, specifically why I did it that way is because I can quickly find the acceleration. No big deal. Everything's done. Now, in order to find the individual tensions, I'm going to have to use a different system. So I've already found A. Now I need to find the tensions. So uh, first off, I'm going to choose the one at the end, which is M1. So now I'm going to say system. Oops. Go back to black. I'm going to go system. And this time it's going to be M1 is the system. And I got to draw a free body diagram. And the free body diagram for this case is going to be, I'm going to make it kind of small just so I can try to fit it here. 
Uh, this is going to be my x-axis. This is going to be my y-axis. And this is going to be my mass right here, which is 10.00 kilograms. Okay. Now, the forces acting on this, of course, are a tension that should be pulling it to the right, which is the positive x direction. So I'm going to put that as T1. Hopefully that, that T1 pointing to the right makes sense to you. But there's also a normal force, which I'll call Fn1. And then there's a weight as well, which is 980.0 newtons in the downward direction. Uh, of course, there's one of those that's not a sig fig, so I have to put it that way. So that's all the forces acting on it. Again, I don't really need to deal with those Y ones. I just wanted to show them to you. Again, we, we're doing the simple check of everything touching M1. Well, there's a rope touching M1 because there's a tension T1 there. There is a tabletop, which is causing the normal force Fn1. And then uh, the things that aren't touching it is the gravitational force because the earth isn't touching it. So uh, we have that force as well. So that's all you my question. Yes. So in the um, full system solution, you had a mass of 26.15 kilograms. Right. And you came up with 256 newtons. Yes. How are you coming up with 980 newtons for something that's smaller? In oh, excuse right? me. It's supposed to be that. Yeah, thanks. Nice correct, uh, correction. I forgot. Uh, I did a different different numbers today when I was solving this. So, yeah, I just multiplied by 100 instead of by 10. So good catch. Thanks for paying attention. I'd like to say that I was checking out, but I'm not. I, that was just a lie. <laughs> so uh, this one is 98.0 newtons because it's 10 times 9.8. So thank you for that. All right. Now we're going to take the summation of the forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration. Again, the acceleration is the same for this one, so I don't have to subscript it. In this case, I've just got T1 is equal to, the mass of this is 10.00 kilograms times A. And of course, A we know is 2.868. Notice by carrying that extra digit, I'm able to carry an extra digit for subsequent calculations, which is good practice. That's what you're supposed to do. So uh, I'm trying to find T1. A was an intermediate calculation for finding T1, but it's best to not round you know, multiple times. So I'm keeping an extra digit. So it turns out that T1 is just going to be equal to using again, T1 is equal to 10 times 2.868. That gives me T1 is 28.68. And this is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. Uh, I had three sig figs with the acceleration. I had four sig figs with the mass. So the answer should be three sig figs. So that's the complete answer there for T1. Any questions on that? Now I need another system. Uh, this time I'm going to use the system as mass M2. So now I'll say system and this is M2 this time. Okay, again, I'm going to draw a free body diagram, trying not to make it too horribly big and trying to look like I'm a drunk person, evidently, drawing it all crooked. <laughs> all right, so this is going to be my x-axis again, and this is going to be my y-axis again. And notice I'm keeping all the axes consistent. Like I wouldn't want to use the positive x-axis pointing to the right for the system and then uh, for the big system and then choose it pointing to the left for M1. That would be just goofy. And you have to make other equations to relate x for M1 to x for M2 to x for uh, the system, uh, the whole train that is. So you just don't want to do that. 
So that's what I've done here. Now the forces again, in this case, I'm gonna draw them all just because we need to get in the swing of drawing them all. Oops. Uh, I have a force from the table because the table's touching it, that's Fn2. I have a force from gravity. Gravity, the earth isn't touching it, but that's one of the things we got to check on our own. In this case, it's actually four times 9.8. And that gives me 39.2. So that's 39.20 newtons pointing downward. Now, here's the neat part. I have a tension to the right that is T2, and then I have a tension to the left that is T1, and we know what that is. In fact, that is 28.68 newtons, okay? This time, I went ahead and carried the extra sig fig on it. Now, I can go ahead and write out my summation of the forces in the X direction. Whoa, did not mean to use red there. So, summation forces in the x direction equals mass times acceleration. Again, there's only one acceleration, so I don't need to subscript that x. Uh, I'm ignoring the y components, but you can see clearly Fn2 is 39.20 newtons, just like Fn1 is 98.0 newtons. Uh, but in examining the x, what I'm going to have is T2 is pointing to the left, so that's going to be a positive. So T2 minus T1, which is 28.68 newtons, is equal to 4.00 kilograms times A. Now, that was really hard to write that A in there. Let me see if I can do something better. There you go. That worked pretty well. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is erase that. <laughs> and there's my A. Okay, uh, now A, we know, of course, the A is 2.868. So I'll put this in here as well. And that's meters per second per second. So we have that. I'm going to take that 2.868 and I'm going to multiply that times 4 and that gives me 11.42 or excuse me 11.47 and let's call that 472 now that's only supposed to have really three sig figs so these two are extra, that's Newtons. Uh, that means it's only to one decimal place, which is the same thing the 28.68 is, it's only to one uh, decimal place. So I can now solve for T2 and see that T2 is 11.472 plus 28 point, or excuse me, yeah, 28.68. And that gives me 40.152. And now whenever my digit that's insignificant is a four or a five, I go ahead and write uh, two digits there. So that's why I'm carrying more sig figs than necessary. Uh, there's the N in uh, the Newtons. So now we have the tension T2 is 40.2. The reason why I do two is notice if I just left a five there, I would instinctively round this to 40.2. But if I had seen that there was a, a five there, what if it was originally four seven? If it was four seven, then I would round that to five as well, the same place. And then I'd round it again and make it uh, 40.2, which wouldn't be correct. It should really be 40.1. So that's why I always do two sig figs uh, if, if the first non-sig fig is a, a five or a four. Any questions on that? All right, so we managed to solve this whole system. Now I will tell you that you can't, you didn't have to solve it this way, but let me explain what would have went down. 
So if you would not have used the whole system, the whole train as a system, then what you'd had to do was write an equation for M3 for F equals MA, and it would have the force on it, but it would also have T2 acting on it, and it would uh, also have an A in it. So there's two unknowns for that equation of motion. That's another word for Newton's second law. It's called equation of motion. Then you'd make up a uh, F equals MA for M2. That would have a T2 acting on it and a T1 acting on it and an A again. So that, in fact, has three unknowns. And then you'd have a uh, Newton's second law for M1. That would have a T1 acting on it and an A. So that's two unknowns. Ultimately, you see you got three unknowns, but you would have three equations. But then you'd have to actually solve that system of three equations, three unknowns. And that's a lot more work and a lot more complicated than what I just did, because you'd first have to solve M1. Uh, and if you didn't do it in this order, it would jack you up. But you'd, you'd solve the M1 scenario first uh, for T1 in terms of A. And then you plug that in to the equation for M2. And again, solve that one for T2 in terms of A. And then you plug that into the equation for M3. And since you've now gotten T1 and T2 in terms of A, that equation will only have A in it and you can solve it. So you can do that for extra credit. So if you want to, and I'll write it up, but solve other way. or extra credit, okay? So feel free to do that. Uh, but that's it. Does anybody have any questions on that problem before I move along? Okay, so the, the F equals MA problem that I solved last time was maybe something you might call the second easiest uh, F equals MA problem. And the reason why it's the second easiest is because I had two forces acting on the thing instead of one. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to go backwards and do a simple version of F equals MA in terms of something you already know. So this time it's going to be example. An example that is consider a mass M in free fall. fairly close to the Earth's surface. The question is going to be, what is the object's Weight W. Okay, so that's really the question, and uh, this one's only going to have one force on it because remember, with free fall, oops, I only put one L in there. With free fall, you basically are imagining an object falling downward with no air resistance, so the only force acting on it is the gravitational force. Uh, and the gravitational force has a name that starts with a W. What would that version of the gravitational force's name be? It is supposed to be really easy, like one that you might see on the screen right now. <laughs> weight. Exactly, the weight. Okay. So here's how we're going to solve it. I'm going to draw... Uh, a mass M. So here's our mass M. And I'm going to draw a coordinate system pointing down. That's going to be my positive Y coordinate system. Uh, and the reason I'm choosing it downward is because I don't like negatives. And the more negatives I get, the more likely I'm going to uh, accidentally confuse a spot on a paper for a negative when it's not a negative, And the more often I'm going to drop negatives. So the less negatives I have, the better. So that's my complete free body diagram of this ball, this mass in free fall. Okay. 
So now I'm going to take the summation of the forces in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction. Now that acceleration in the y direction is the only acceleration at all. So we can really uh, don't necessarily have to call it the y direction. But the main thing I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to figure out exactly what the weight is. So I've got to include that force. Sorry. Uh, Michael, are you asking me something or are you just talking? Okay. All right. So this is the force acting on it. And we called it W for weight. Okay. So what that means is this left-hand side of the equation is just going to be W. Now... What we learned when we studied free fall and projectile motion is we learned what the acceleration of an object in free fall was. Can anybody tell me what the acceleration of an object in free fall is? Nine point eight meters per second. Exactly. Per second. And since I chose downward as positive, it's actually positive nine point eight. So, uh, and instead of actually writing 9.8, I'm going to write the symbol because then it gives us a little bit more understanding. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's the object's mass times G. And the reason why the G is more general than writing 9.8, because G would be understood to be gravitational acceleration for wherever you are. So if you're doing it on the moon, it will be one sixth of 9.8. Or if you're doing it on Jupiter, it's going to be like 27.89 meters per second every second, that sort of thing. But the main thing is I've now filled in this equation. And because of that, I know exactly what the weight is. The weight is equal to M times G. So that's where the formula weight equals M times G comes from. Any questions on that one? All right, so we've done a, uh, a, a mass or a train of masses, if you will, and we've used that to solve a system of uh, uh, equations and managed to solve for the acceleration of the train as well as the acceleration of the individual masses and to find the tension in the ropes. Uh, I will also tell you that from this, you should be able to see that uh, from the Newton's second law, Let's go back to black here. So from Newton's second law, OK, what I have is the summation of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Uh, I can take that and put a bracket around it because then we know it means the dimension. So what I've told you is the SI unit of force equals the Newton. Okay. So I'm going to say this is equal to the Newton. Uh, the SI unit for mass is the kilogram, and the SI unit for acceleration is meters per second squared, or meters per second per second. It doesn't really matter too much in this case because we're not actually you know, physically playing it out. But putting this all together, we're able to conclude that one Newton is equal to one kilogram times a meter per second squared. So we get that one Newton reduces to one kilogram times a meter per second squared. And that really is important. It's something that's gonna uh, be used for your entire, uh, well, more or less, if you're considering engineering, physics, or chemistry, uh, and maybe even some of the biological sciences, this is going to be something that goes over and over and over again. It's always going to happen. 
So for instance, even energy, the units we use for energy are either the calorie or the joule. Uh, the British system has the BTU and stuff like that, but I'm really talking about the joule uh, or the calorie. And the joule is really a Newton times a meter. So a, a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So even in chemistry and biology, you're going to constantly be running into like joules and have to figure out what those units are made of so that you can figure out what the units come out to be. So it's really important that you know that the Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared. Any questions on that? All right, I've got another problem that's pretty classic and it's called the Atwood machine. So let's say solve, here's another example. Whoa. Solve the Atwood machine. for A and T, assuming M, big M, and G are known. So the Atwood machine in its strictest sense really is a pulley with two masses hanging over it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a circle like this, and that's going to represent a massless, frictionless pulley. Now, you might think, why are we doing physics if right off the get-go we start making up problems that aren't real? Uh, so the answer is a little nuanced, but uh, in some sense, even a massless and frictionless pulley is real. What I mean by that is if I'm using masses that are, our rule of thumb is a factor of 10, but if I'm using a, a or if I'm using masses to hang from this pulley, that are 10 times or more heavier than the pulley, then the mass turns out is not gonna be a huge part of it. I, I personally prefer a factor of 100, but the bare minimum is a factor of 10. Same thing with the forces. If, if I have forces that are a whole factor of 10 larger than the frictionless forces, then it turns out the uh, friction forces are not gonna cause a huge uh, change in your answers. So that's why we are able to solve this. What I am going to do, in fact, though, is I'm going to hang from it a mass, big M, okay? And we're going on the assumption that I actually know what that mass is. And now I'm gonna hang from it another mass And that mass is going to be little m. Now, the fact that I use big M and little m probably should tell you, oh, I think he's pretending like big M is going to be heavier than little m. And that's exactly what I'm shooting for. OK, so there's the Atwood machine. And what I'm going to explain to you is if I if we assume that the string going over the pulley is, again, massless, OK, just like the pulley is. Uh, and that it won't stretch or get slack, then if I move the mass big M down one, uh, one inch, then the bass little M will move up one inch. If I do it in a second, it'll happen in a second. If I move it one inch per second, and then after a second, start moving it at two inches per second, the same thing's going to happen to the little m. So again, we get the accelerations, at least the magnitudes of the acceleration, the magnitudes of the speed, and the magnitudes of the displacement are equal for the two objects. So that's what we're going to start off with. So now let's do our solution. Now, this is a case where, in principle, you could pretend the system is M plus M, I do not recommend you doing that. There's a, a ton of reasons that you're going to make mistakes on that. So don't do it. Don't ever do it with that one machine or anything that looks like that one machine. Okay. 
So uh, in this case, I've got to draw a free body diagram, and I'm first going to draw the free body diagram for M. So free body diagram for big M. Okay. Now it looks to me like this whole drawing set up for M to be real big M to be really big compared to little M, and that big M is going to fall downward. Okay. So I'm going to choose that direction to be my positive Y axis. So here's my coordinate system. Actually, let me draw it with a straighter line than that. Here's my coordinate system. This is the positive Y axis. This is a mass big M. And the forces I have acting on it is basically this force, which we just learned was MG. And then uh, if you ask the mass big M, uh, what it was experiencing, it would probably say something along the lines of, well, I was hanging here from this rope, scared I could fall at 9.8 meters per second per second and just die. But luckily, there was this rope behind me slowing me down. Just by thinking that way, you reach the conclusion that the tension on this mass is acting upwards. Now, I'm just going to call that T. I don't need to call it T left or T right or T1 or T2, because there's no reason to believe the two tensions will be different. Uh, what I can tell you to make you understand that is if there was actually a, a massive pulley, a pulley that had a significant mass and a, or a significant friction or both, then that tension uh, would be required to not only lift mass little m and accelerate it at the same rate as big m, but also would be required to speed up and accelerate the massive pulley with friction. So the tension on the right-hand side would actually be larger in that case, and the tension on the left-hand side would be smaller. Now, if we consider that the mass of the pulley and the friction of the pulley is zero, then the two, then the two tensions are the same. So that's why I'm using it this way, all right? Now, I can use Newton's second law. Now, again, there's really only one acceleration. It's the object of mass M going down uh, will have an acceleration A, and that's going to cause the object of mass little m going up with an acceleration A. So I'm just going to call it A. But what I know is the left-hand side is going to be M G minus T is equal to big M times A, and I'm going to call that equation one. Okay. It turns out when you're doing systems of equations, you know, if you have uh, three unknowns, you have to have three equations. If you have 42 unknowns, you're going to have to have 42 equations, right? So when you get bogged down in systems of equations, you, you've got to sort of be a little bit I don't know, uh, obsessive about it, because if by some chance you happen to maybe put one of the equations together with another equation, and maybe you make a careless arithmetic or algebraic error, by some freak of nature, without ever using the third equation, you could actually manage to solve all three unknowns, but it'd be completely wrong. Uh, so one way of keeping track to make sure you've used up all the equations is to number them. And then you can go back and look at your notes and say, oh yeah, I used all of them. So that's why I'm telling you to do that. Anybody have any questions on, uh, MG minus T equals MA, why there's a minus sign, why is the MG positive, why is the T negative, that sort of thing. Anybody have any questions like that? Okay, remember the left-hand side of Newton's second law is always addition, but in this case, I just wrote it as minus T because I know that's, you know, what ultimately adding a negative does. So now I'm going to draw the free body diagram of the left mass, and there's a key point to be learned here. So free body diagram, and this one's for little m. Now, the lesson to be learned here is it's not required to do this, but when you go to uh, break a system up into different parts, it's best or often a lot easier if you choose consistency from one coordinate system to the other. What I mean by that 
is if I chose big M going down as the positive direction, and then I chose little m going up, which is the same thing as big M going down, if I then chose little m going up as a negative direction, I have to have another equation to relate the acceleration of little m to the acceleration of big M. So you don't want to do that. So by recognizing that when big M goes down, little m goes up, then that should tell you, oh, okay, when I do my coordinate system for little m, I need up to be the positive direction and I need down to be the negative, uh, the positive, ooh, excuse me, down to be the negative direction. So I'm going to draw my coordinate system again. Here's the coordinate system. In this case, we see that the positive x-axis is upward. Here's the mass, little m. And the tension is what's pulling it up. So that's going to be the green one on this case because that happens to be positive. So there's T. And then there's going to be the weight pulling it down. And that one's going to be little m, G. So notice again, I, I didn't state it out loud, but I did check everything that's touching it has to apply a force to it. And then I also have to check gravity. So now I have that. Now I can say Newton's second law says the summation of the forces in the y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. And since I have made a, cons uh, a consistent coordinate system between the two setups, I don't have to have another equation to relate A of M you know, A of the little m to A of the big m. So this equation is just going to turn out to be T minus little m g is equal to little m A. Notice by breaking it up in, in separate parts, there's no ambiguity about what m goes next to the A. It has to be the only m, okay? So now I've got equation two. So part of the reason I'm showing you this is, one, I want to show you how to break it up into systems. Two, I want to show you how to link the coordinate systems together so that you don't uh, have to make yourself do a lot of work. But three, I want to teach you a, system, a way of solving systems of equations. You guys have all had, uh, you know, pre-calc, uh, pre-calc one, pre-calc two. So you probably know how to solve systems of equations. Uh I'm going to use one of those methods and it's no big deal. Another problem I'm going to solve is going to use an entirely different method that you didn't learn from your math. So that's the reason I'm doing that one. So what I'm going to do is uh, one way that we know to add or to solve a system of equations is you might remember you could multiply one of the equations by a number and then you can multiply the other equation by another number. And in doing so, that might make one of the unknowns, for instance, have a positive three coefficient. And then in the other equation, it's going to have a negative three coefficient. And by having equal but opposite coefficients, you can just add those two equations and that particular unknown will cancel out. Well, this one's already set up. I've already got T negative in equation one and T positive in equation two. So I'm just going to add the system of equations. So add equations one and two. Now you can see by that sentence alone that I've used both equations. I have two unknowns, T and A. So uh, now I'm going to add them and I'm going to add them in a very specific way. I'm going to go MG minus T is equal to MA. And over this side, I'm going to say minus MG plus T is equal to m a okay and i'm just going to add these equations now i'm also going to take a jump in algebra here so uh, feel free to fill in the gap but i'm going to realize that t and negative t are going to cancel out and in fact m g minus little m g both have a factor of g in it so i'm going to factor that out to begin with so I'm going to say M minus little m, parenthesis G, is equal to, similarly on the right-hand side, big M A and little m A both have an A in it. So I'm going to say M plus little m times A for the right-hand side. Now I can easily solve for the acceleration, and I get A is equal to M minus m 
over M plus M, all that times G. And this is really a preferred way of writing a theoretical solution. Notice the thing on the left-hand side that we're solving for, A, is an acceleration. So ideally, you'd like it to be completely unambiguous what its units are. So a way you can do that is you can separate it into two factors or three factors or 50 factors, doesn't matter. But the main thing is separate it into factors that have no units times something that has the units that you want. If you notice M minus M, they both have to have units of kilograms or you can't subtract them. And M plus M is the same thing. So you got kilograms over kilograms. That means no units for the parenthesis. So in the parentheticals, there's no units, but the G has a unit of acceleration that everybody knows because G is G. So this is a really great way of writing it. Any questions on that? And I want to point out here, I'm getting ready to solve for the tension too, but uh, by solving it all with symbols this way, I now have solved an infinity of problems. There is literally an infinite number of combinations of big M and little m uh, that I've solved. So that's really way more valuable than just putting in the numbers. Now, I'm free to choose how I want to solve for T, but I'm going to choose the easiest way that I can think of. And if I look at equation two, I see that T already has a positive in front of it. So I ain't got to do with, deal with a negative. So I'm going to use T and I'm going to plug in what I call equation three. So I'm going to name this equation three and I'm going to plug... three into two. Okay, so when I do that, I get T minus MG is equal to M times M minus M over M plus M times G. Okay, now I can go ahead and realize that if I keep the T on the left-hand side, it'll become positive. And I pull the big, uh, if I pull the MG to the right-hand side, it'll become positive too. So I've got M times G plus, now I'm going to distribute that little M and I'm going to get M times big M minus M squared. All that's going to be divided by big M plus little m and times G. Now I can notice a couple of things. One, both terms have a G in it. So I'm going to factor that out. And two, I would really like to have a common denominator. So I'm going to do that as well. So I'm going to write this as basically I'm going to take the lowercase m and multiply it by m plus m over m plus m. So when I multiply little m times big M plus m, I get little m times big M plus little m squared, because that's little m times little m. And then all that's going to be divided by m plus m. And then the other term is m m minus m squared. Again, that's over m plus little m. And then I've got the g there. OK, now they have a common denominator, so I can just add in uh, the the numerators of the fractions. You can see the M and the little M times the big M appears twice. So that's going to be two times that. And the M squared is once positive and once negative. So they're going to cancel out. So I finally have an answer and I'm going to write it in a very specific way. I'm going to say that, in fact, uh, two m over m plus m. Notice that has no units. The big M has a unit of kilograms. The m plus little m has a unit of kilograms. That cancels out. But I still have uh, the little m because it was two times m, little m times big M. So I still have the little m times g to go. And of course, that clearly has units of newtons or force which is consistent with what I told you before. Namely, in this case, I'm solving for a tension, which is a force. And I want that ideally to have a pure number multiplied by something that clearly has units of Newtons. And that's what this does. And it also sort of looks like, you know, lowercase mg. Oh yeah, that sort of looks like something that's, you know, 
directly related to the tension is obviously because I've got to lift up mg. Not only that, these two equations, three and four, uh, they're going to be identical to uh, some equations we get later for uh, a collision, a uh, one-dimensional collision. You're going to get m minus m over m plus m, except it's going to be times like a v instead of a g, and you're going to get a 2m m over m plus m. So these things pop up over and over again, and it's really nice to see them that way. One thing you might want to notice is what would what would you expect the acceleration of the big M to be if I all of a sudden cut the rope so that little M's not there anymore? G. Yeah, you'd expect it to be G. And notice if I did that, if I went ahead and looked at equation three, that would be equivalent to making the little M zero. If I made the little m zero, it would be big M minus zero over B, big M plus zero, which is just M over M. So that's just one. And then all that times G. And lo and behold, we get exactly positive G. So that's another thing that you, uh, writing these in symbol form helps you. It, you can look at it and see if it uh, gives you the proper uh, response in weird cases or extreme cases like you know M going to zero. Also, if you looked at it and said, well, what if little m was the bigger of the two? Well, if little m was the bigger of the two, in other words, like little m had a mass of 100 kilograms and big m was only 25 kilograms, then m minus m would actually give you a negative number and you'd actually expect big m to accelerate upwards, which is the negative direction, and you'd get a negative acceleration there. So all sorts of good stuff comes from it. All right. Uh, I would like to ask you, does anybody have any questions on this? We're almost running out of time, and I have two more things I want to show you. Anybody have any? All right. So another problem that's common is uh, this guy. Let's, let's imagine we have a rear view mirror. Like this, OK? That's supposed to be a rear view mirror. This is where it would attach to the windshield, of course. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hang some fuzzy dice, say, from the rearview mirror. And in fact, those fuzzy dice are going to make an angle theta with the vertical. And I'm going to assume those fuzzy dice are actually really nice, so they're like a plumb bob, so that their shape and their weight distribution isn't making the thing go at some weird angle or anything. But this is going to have a mass M. So what I want you to do is assuming or assume we know M and theta and gravitational acceleration, what is the acceleration of the car? Okay, so this is supposed to be a rear view mirror. Hopefully, y'all recognize it. Uh, the scenario is basically this is the glass that I'm drawing right here. And obviously your eyes would be like here, say. So uh, the hood is to the right. Uh, would y'all think the car is accelerating to the right or the left by looking at this? To the right. Exactly. Okay. So now I'm going to draw a free body diagram and we're going to solve this. So here's our solution. So the free body diagram what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a little mass M right here. And I'm going to have a coordinate system. That has Y going upward. And X going to the right. And of course, negative X going to the left and negative Y going uh, to the downward direction. And I'm going to have a tension. Oops. I'm going to have a tension. I don't want to use green for that. I would rather use blue. Yes. 
this is going to be a tension T. And notice I didn't draw it red or green because uh, that's not really parallel to either coordinate system. What I do know, of course, is that is that this angle right here is theta, and that means this angle right here is also theta. Okay? So I can now interpret the tension as having a X component that is in the positive direction. That's T sub X is equal to uh, T times the sine of theta, and then the T has a Y component, T sub Y, which is equal to T cosine theta. And then I also have another force. Notice that's the only thing touching the ball was a string. So I've accounted for the stuff touching the ball. Now the remaining thing is look for a gravitational force or something like that, an action at a distance. And in this case, I have an, a force due to gravity that is mg, like that. So now I've got all my vectors not only in the coordinate system, but uh, rendered in ways that they're uh, parallel to the appropriate axes so I can use them. So now I'm going to take the summation of the forces in the x direction. Well, actually, I'll do the y direction first and the y direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the y direction. Now, what I'm imagining here is some, uh, some way we've managed to hit the accelerator of the car, and the car is in a constant acceleration state, so that the acceleration is not wavering. Because of that, this ball is going to be basically stationary with respect to the car, so the acceleration in the y direction really should be zero. OK, now the weird part is it is relative to the car not moving, but the car is actually accelerating to the right with an acceleration A that we want to know. So there is an acceleration in the X direction. That's what we're going to have to come up with. So right now I'm going to go ahead and finish out Newton's second law for the Y direction. And that is T sine theta or excuse me, T cosine theta. So T cosine theta uh, minus mg is equal to zero. And I just know that I really would prefer to have this written as T cosine theta is equal to mg. And I'm going to call that equation one. Now I'm going to take the summation of the forces in the x direction equals mass times acceleration in the x direction. And I'm going to remind you that this is the acceleration A of the car. Well, I don't think I could write a worse word D there. Okay, so that's just the acceleration of the car, which we're going to use. Now, in this case, I really only have a force to the right. So I'm going to write T sine theta. is equal to MA, and that's going to be called equation two. Now, here's the mathematical trick that I'm going to teach you, and, and you need to know it. That's part of the reason I'm solving this problem, and you wouldn't have gotten it from your math classes, and I'll tell you why in a second. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide two by one. Now, the reason they didn't show you that in your math classes is you always got to worry about when you're dividing, dividing by zero. Uh, this is a physical problem where dividing by zero wouldn't make any sense because there's no way equation one could actually be zero. So I don't have to think about that stuff in a physics problem. Uh, a lot of times I don't have to think about convergence and stuff like that that you learn in, in calculus. Uh, that's sort of the beauty that we have for physics as opposed to math. So uh, in this case, it does work. Now, be advised, uh, you know, you can always do whatever you want to an equation, but whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. 
there is actually a caveat to that. You're not allowed to multiply both sides of the equation by zero or obviously to divide both sides of the equation by zero. Uh, if you do that, you actually, if you do it in a weird way, you can actually get a symbolic response that's not zero, but it is no longer true because you divided by zero or you multiplied by zero. And so a lot of times when you find little trick, uh, trick number questions or trick number stories that you might find in a newspaper or in a joke book or in a math book or something like that, a lot of times where they've uh, shown you proving four equals 11 or something, that's because at some point you inadvertently divided through by zero or multiplied through by zero. So just keep that in mind. Now, when I divide two by one, what I'm going to get is T sine theta over T cosine theta is equal to M A over mg and this is beautiful because the m's cancel out and the t's cancel out and in fact ultimately you get a is equal to g and of course sine theta over cosine theta is tangent theta so you get a tangent theta So if you were able to, and, and don't do this because obviously driving, you need to pay attention to driving, but if you hung a protractor from your rear view mirror with your fuzzy dice and you could actually accurately read uh, the angle theta to the nearest degree or even half a degree, uh, you could get a pretty good accurate measure of the actual acceleration of the car. You can, by the way, also now solve for the tension if you want, even though that's not something we normally need you to do in this problem. I'll just tell you that if you choose to do so, then you might want to make use of this wonderful little triangle we made where theta is this, and A is that, and G is that, and then this would be the square root of A squared plus G squared, like that. So that, uh, for instance, cosine theta would be G over the square root of A squared plus G squared. And then you can plug that back in, say, into 1 and uh, use that to get what T is. So, uh, for instance, T would equal MG over cosine theta, which would be MG over... G over square root A squared plus G squared, like that. Obviously, that's going to become T is equal to M times the square root of A squared plus G squared, like that. And you could ultimately get A in terms of just the uh, theta, if you wanted, by plugging it back in there, uh, G tangent theta. But we've got far enough here with solving uh, that tension. Any questions on that one? All right, we got a really quick problem here that I want to show you. And, and there's some main parts I want to get to. Uh, what we're going to imagine here is we're going to imagine an inclined plane. Okay. And this inclined plane makes an angle theta that we pretend we know. And on it will be a block of mass M. And uh, we're going to have a force parallel to the plane F pulling it up. And what I'd like to find is what is A for that, okay? Well, it turns out when you have this kind of problem, it's really, really smart to choose a coordinate system that's tilted. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a free body diagram using this tilted coordinate system, X prime pointing up, and then... Y prime that way. Okay, that's really a bad looking. Oh, that looks better already. Okay, so that's really a bad looking one. Uh, what I will do is draw lightly where the original X axis was and the original Y axis was just so you can have some bearing. And what that means is this angle is theta and that same angle is theta. Now, when we have it like this, what we know is there is a force on the mass M, which is right here. There's going to be a force that's not aligned to either of the axes. That force is going to be Mg. 
there will be a force that is aligned to the axes, uh, specifically the force going up the incline, which was the F force. Okay, so that's the F. There's also going to be the normal force that way, and uh, that's pretty much it. Now, the black one's remaining black, but I think you can see that uh, this angle right here and this angle are what ca what's called vertical angles. And that means they're angles across a vertex. It doesn't mean they're actually vertical. And by default, those angles are always equal. So this angle right here is also theta. Now that I have that, I can realize that the Y prime component of MG is this, and it's MG cosine theta. And the X prime component, I'm going to have to make this MG a little longer just to make it look right. Okay. The X component is going to be in the negative direction, and that's going to be mg sine theta, which I think y'all can find in the very first episode of Big Bang Theory when they were trying to push a TV up the stairs. But anyways, that's actually what it turns out to be. Now, if I do the summation forces in the Y direction equals mass times acceleration in the Y direction, and realizing that the thing's not going to jump off the incline or dig into the incline, that gives me acceleration of zero. But from this, I can, in fact, figure out that Fn minus mg cosine theta is equal to zero. So in this case, the normal force is just mg cosine theta. And this is exactly why if you go in snow prone areas, you'll find roofs are often quite steep because as theta goes to 90 degrees, cosine goes to zero, so you don't need as much rafter strength. Uh, however, if you're doing a hurricane area, then you want a more flat, but neither here nor there. Now, the summation of forces in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. That's the only acceleration we're going to see. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get F minus mg sine theta is equal to ma, so I can get A is equal to F over M minus G sine theta. And I didn't really care that much, to be honest with you, about this result. All I cared about was that you see me break that vector up into components parallel and perpendicular to the plane and see how we had to do that and where the theta was and all that good stuff. But we do have the problem solved. Everybody, of course, is free to go. I just want to let you know, uh, that's what that's was our goal today is to make sure we handle this. So uh, y'all are free to go. I'll wait for the last uh, person to leave in case anybody has any questions. But have a good weekend and know that you're going to have a practice test posted in about 20 minutes. See you guys. Hey, Professor, this is uh, John. Yes. So I don't know if you've noticed, but I am struggling to keep up ever since my Memorial Day uh internet outage right um, i'm doing the best i can i have sorry i have limited it with work and school um kids and all that so i'm doing right. the best i can um i know you don't have to with any flexibility would be appreciated but i'm going to keep i just let you know i'm going to keep on working the best i can but i'm, no I'm aware of turning things in late and i'm just i'm trying to work through it yeah no <laughs> problem man just uh do that uh I, I sort of have a policy where I really care that you peak at the right time. So even if you like tank the first test and yeah. stuff like that, if I see a transition where your grades getting better and better, you'd be surprised what grades I'll throw out. Okay? okay. So don't worry about things being late. Just keep, keep doing them. The fact that you do them helps me because I don't do much to help students that don't do their homework, but I yeah. will do quite a bit for students that did all their homework, even though in some cases they were late. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, touch base with you. That's all. No problem. I didn't take it as any disrespect or you uh, giving up or throwing a class away or anything. So just keep up the good work and let me know if I can help you. All right. Thanks. No problem. See you, John. Anybody else have any questions? I got a question for you. Yes. So my internet kind of like didn't work for the first like three 
three, four minutes of class? Did okay. you, what did you say in the first three, four minutes of class? Uh, let's see. Like, I, I got the problems. I, I just didn't know like, like if you said anything about like um schoolwork. Like what I, I did tell them that I'd be making a practice of test for the test that's coming Monday, uh, specifically on chapters one, two, and three. So I said that. I also reminded them about F equals MA being broken up into X components, Y components, and Z components. And I, I just stressed what I was going to talk about, which is choosing what system you're applying F equals MA to, uh, making sure you use the appropriate units, making sure you use uh, some tricks that I told them on making sure they get all the forces in the free body diagram, that kind of stuff. But that's about it. And and you'll see it. This the video will be posted tonight, or it'll definitely be up by first thing in the morning. But I always post it at night, so it's usually done by like midnight or something. Also, um, that that practice test. When is it due? Uh, the the actual test that you take uh happens during your lab. So the practice test will no longer be able to be done uh, once your lab class starts. Actually, it's once your lecture starts. So uh, because I forgot your labs after lecture. So our class starts at 520. So 520 on Monday, uh, the practice test will go away. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. See you, Josh. Anybody else? Alyssa, Logan, Evelyn, Enrique. Oh, so Oh, yes. So I actually do have a question. I noticed earlier today that the test two for chapter three and four was pushed till the 24th. Is that accurate or was that a mistake? No, I didn't mean to push that back. I, I wanted y'all to have plenty of time to work more on uh, this face-to-face -face test that's coming. And also I wanted to make sure that y'all had a better understanding of four, which literally we just started covering. So yeah, I did push it back to the 24th. Uh, so that should give you a, a little bit more time. Of course, now it's right right before the test. Actually, I think I'm going to push it back even further. I think I'm going to push it back to the 26th. Okay. Will the practice test also for the yes. practice test number two also? Okay. Yeah, because yeah. I just noticed that the practice test wasn't available, but the actual test two was. So I just wanted to confirm that. And yeah, that one more pretty... question. Good Sorry, work. one more question. Um. Uh, for the actual face-to-face -face exam, uh, for that one, we're allowed to have a sheet with the equations, correct? Or no? it, yes, and it, I, I I don't care how many sheets you have, you're you're only allowed to take the equations from your textbook that are numbered. So if you look in your textbook and it has you know uh, an equation, and next to that equation it has a left parenthesis followed by a chapter number then a dash, and then another number to represent the equation, and then close parenthesis, then that means that's equa an equation you're allowed to have on your uh, equation sheet. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. I've already changed the test to due date. Now I'm going to change the practice test due date. Okay, have a good evening. <laughs> Thank you, you too. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Anybody else have any questions? Um, so I was just checking back to see if you thought about me taking the test on Monday at my house since I drive two hours. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think I can do that. I'm going to have to set up a separate one for you. Uh, that'll be a Respondus lockdown browser with Respondus monitor. So you just have to use that. Uh, make sure you, you follow the instructions like it's going to ask you to, one, show your ID uh, so you're supposed to show your ID to the camera and have your face next to it so I can see it. Two, you're supposed yeah. to take your camera and show your workspace. Three, yeah, I've done it. I've done it before, so. Okay, yeah, all good. that stuff. Just make sure you do that. I've had people not not be so cool with doing that, so. Yeah, I will. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Thanks. Anybody? Oh, that looks like is it. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.